Hey everybody, welcome back. This is episode 223 of the Laravel News Podcast. Today is September 17th, 2024. Mr. Dorinda, you're looking mighty dapper in that uh, LN hat of yours. Hey, you know what? Okay, Sorry, LN quick hat. aside before I let you respond. Do you know what svelte means? Svelte, yeah, it's it's like smooth, suave, something like that. Like Apparently that- the definition is a tall, thin, handsome person, I think. You're right. I need to look go. this up. That Somebody said this to very me the specific. other day. Is that, it's almost I like know. they they opened up and they like looked at you and they went svelte. That's what we're gonna say. Slender and elegant. So some dude the other day, I was we were at church and he was like, "Hey, dude, looking svelte." I was like, "I think that's a compliment." Not sure. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> and he said, "It literally means like a tall, thin, handsome person." And I was like, "Thank you," but mm-hmm. okay. That was an odd way to say that. A dapper. You know, like I usually like if somebody's dapper, looking like yeah. if somebody's like dressing dress, you know, dress nice, they're dapper, whatever, svelte. So I was like, Svelte. I was like, Are you a are you a developer? Like, do you know JavaScript? Svelte? You know, no. whatever. No. <laughs> I thought that was interesting though. But dapper, you are looking mighty dapper in that hat, my friend. It looks good. good. And uh came all the way you, from Latvia. Yes. And for any of you wondering, you can buy one of your own on the Laravel News uh website store. Let's remember to put a, a link in the show notes. There's a few mm-hmm. different swag items, so check that out. Mm-hmm. What you won't make be able sure. to buy on the Laravel News Store or anywhere else is this T-shirt that I'm wearing. Ooh, Laracon Australia T-shirt. It's Early Laracon release. Laracon Australia T-shirt goes only, only to attendees of Laracon AU in November. This is the only T-shirt in existence. Um, at the moment, but we just sent our order yesterday to the printer. I just approved the final proof for printing, so that will all be happening very soon. Mm. It looks. And there'll it be looks hundreds, good. hundreds of sibling shirts out in the out in the wild. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I will tell you, uh, Michael is being pretty hardcore about this because we've asked close friends of his and he said are you coming to Laracon Lair- Australia I said mm-hmm. no and he said then you mm-hmm. won't be getting one so <laughs> no know, love I heard Laracon Even for the US close didn't have a shirt this year it didn't it did not have a shirt I got you know I got socks I got a little pen and a notepad and uh, a badge and a little bag the mm-hmm. bag is cool mm-hmm. the little bag mm-hmm. is cool but no shirt no shirt this year all the money must have gone into those CO2 cannons, the CO2 jets on the stage. Those are pretty cool, I got to say. Those are pretty neat. Yes. Yes, although I, uh, if I would have been one of the people coming out, I, you know, um, I don't know. Had a there was on, I feel like there was only a couple like people who speakers, did really well with it. Mm-hmm. I feel like the speakers, they, because um, Kapehe came out and did a... Uh, Kapehe did a hula. A hula. And, yep, she did really good. Uh, I think Rissa did a bit of a dance from what I saw. Rissa did so, really good too. Yes, she did. Both of those ladies, super athletic. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, or is athletic the word for it? Graceful? I don't know what the mm-hmm. word was. But both did a great job. Represented the community well. Yeah, the dudes, other than, you know, like Jack McDade did his whole bit. I was waiting for yeah, him to well, do a front flip, like a front roll. Was, you know what I mean? I'm like, if he I was wanting his cane to like Wonka stick in the stage. And didn't, and didn't do that. He did. He Next did time. like the step down the stairs and step back up the stairs. You know, like that mm-hmm. Willy Wonka thing. Yeah, yeah. And I was I waiting that, for the cane to like stick in the stage and do the front roll. And oh man, it's okay. Excellent. He did a great As job. As only Jack McDade can. We did As only uh, in Jack the, in the can. Laracon AU speaker chat. I did joke about um, <laughs> some things that we could do for <laughs> the conference. Just as a bit of fun, but um, I don't. Can you get some? Can now. you get some people with compressed air on either side of like you know two guys with just compressed air cans and just like shoot them don't, when they're coming up? Don't think that I didn't look all this stuff up. <laughs> I have looked. I have found all the places uh, that I can hilarious. find out all of the things. We are we are certainly going to do a bit bit more this year than what we have in years past in terms of of um, stage dressing and things like that. So you know I'm those cubes, to, those cubes on the U.S. stage were custom made. And so mm. I'm curious what happened with those. Like, did they ship those off somewhere? Like, where are those at? You know what I mean? They'd be in storage somewhere, no doubt. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Maybe. Maybe they'll use them next year. I don't know. Otherwise, I might have to snag one and put it in my put it in my office or something, hang it from the ceiling. I don't know. Folks, this is going way too long as an intro. Hey, we wanted to <laughs> let you know that uh, Honey Badger is our sponsor today. And uh, they love to have lots of fun, too. Really great company. 
and we're going to talk about them a little bit later in the show. But I wanted to thank them for sponsoring. Michael, should we get into it, my friend? I think we should. Yeah. All right. We have got Laravel 11.22. This would have been published the week of September 4th. They released the Chaperone Eloquent Method for Inverse Relationships, um, support for passing backed enums to queuable methods, and the ability to pass backed enums to route name and domain methods, and more. Let's talk first about this Chaperone Eloquent Relations thing. So um, we actually have a YouTube video uh, if that happens to be the way that you prefer to learn, I actually really like this on Spassi's, uh docs. They'll have spots at the bottom that says, are you a visual learner? And then they'll have like a little video instead of text. Mm -hmm. And so folks, you get both. Uh, we have the podcast, we have the blog post, and we have a video that goes along with this Laravel Chaperone method. method. So if my explanation is insufficient, uh, hint, it likely will be, uh, then you can go watch this or you can hear Michael explain it after I do my best. Okay, so Samuel Levy contributed the eloquent inverse chaperone model relation that Taylor demonstrated in his keynote this year uh, during the open source part of the talk. So uh, here's what we've got. If you have a model that has a comments relationship on it, it's returning a has many, uh, you would have a return, this has many comment class, and then you can chaperone the post, arrow, chaperone, post. Now what this chaperone inverse slash inverse method uh, avoids is unexpected n plus one queries that link back to the parent after the relationship query has run. So let's say you have a, you know, you have a post here and you're pulling the comments, but once you're in a comment, you need to refer back to the post to figure out like maybe how many days after the post was created with this comment made. And so you're going to diff the dates or something like that, right? So if you're on the comment and you say arrow post and give me the date of the created of that post, you might end up with a weird n plus one query when you link back to that parent relationship. And so what this will do, this chaperone, it will link the appropriate post model in the correct relation on the comment instance as well with the scopes intact. And so this is a problem that was very difficult to solve previously. Um, and it has now been solved thanks to Samuel Levy. Uh, and I think he originally was calling it inverse, but Taylor with his amazing, you know, marketing hat on, uh, decided to name it Chapro, which is a great name for it. And, uh, as I said, you can find more information about that in the video here or, uh, Look at, it in, look at it in the uh, docs as well or in the pull request number 51582. Michael, anything else on that one that I might have missed? Yeah, I think I suppose the key thing that you would want to do in, the, in this situation that you might, might have done in the past is to iterate over each of the records and then you can use the child records or the related records set relation method to then link back to the ah, parent, sure. which you would have done manually. And, and Eric goes through that in the uh, video where he references that from Taylor's keynote where you would say like user with posts and then if you were to then say iterate over each of those posts, you'd say user posts each and then do whatever you would do. But if, if you're in the context of post and you were to then say post author, which links back to the original user, right? Yeah, it would then obviously make that N plus one query. And I think Jonathan Rennick talked about this kind of thing in his eloquent course that he put out a couple of years ago now where he introduced or sort of brought to the fore this set relation method. So this chaperone inverse method allows you to basically encapsulate all of that with, with framework functionality. So you don't have to remember to do that or don't run the risk of, of those N plus one queries. So it's a nice, um, as you say, Taylor's marketing hat on naming that thing, but the inverse method is still there as the underlying functionality as a, um, you know, as an alias to it. So yeah, nice, good, good functionality there. Absolutely. We've also got uh, support for backed enums in a couple different places. So let me talk about this real quick. So if you haven't been using enums yet, you definitely should. They're a great way to replace little magic strings that end up getting littered around your code base. Um, they're good for all sorts of things. Like, for example, if I have a queue that I want to dispatch something onto, I have a job and I want to specify in that job, here's the queue that it should go on to. Well, you're likely going to need to reuse that same queue name, either in your horizon.php configuration or in your queue.php configuration. You're going to need to specify that somewhere else. And it would be nice if you didn't just have to have a string reference to it, especially in the case that you want to update it later on. You can find all those references by using something else, namely an enum. 
And in this case, uh, it's going to have to be a backed enum because this method, or sorry, this um, queue needs to be represented by a string. And so you need to have a backed enum. Well, the only annoying thing about using backed enums is that when you want to get the string representation of one of the cases, you have to specify the case. So I'm going to say Q colon colon my Q name arrow value is typically what you have to do. But what Laravel has been doing more and more is they've been finding other spots inside the framework that will just accept that enum without having to do the arrow value. It just accepts the enum case and then it will handle doing the arrow value for you behind the scenes. So Seth Fat contributed support for backed enum in the queuable trait methods. So on queue or on connection or all on queue or all on connection, now instead of having to pass the uh, you know arrow value, you can just pass the actual enum case itself, which is really nice. It now feels more like um, what it used to be before we had enums where we do a class with a constant and you just have that constant that was backed by some string. And so you'd say, you know, Q connection, colon, colon, my Q. Um, and, and you wouldn't have to do any of this name, this arrow value stuff. So it feels much cleaner uh, than, it, than it has. And this is something I need to actually dig into a little bit because I'm curious how they're, how they're doing that, like what they're using in order to determine if it's a back to enum and then pulling the string value off of it. Because I have a couple places uh, where I would really like to be able to just pass the enum in rather than the mm -hmm. value. Uh, and so that would be nice. So we don't, have to, we don't have to go and give people homework here. You can do an instance of check on okay. these things. So you can say like uh, okay. color value instance of back to enum. And that will tell okay. you if it and is, just and do then, arrow you know, value. if it's a backed enum, you can just do arrow value in the context nice. of, of those methods. Uh, Easy enough. Straightforward. It's it's harder. I think it's harder to determine if it's a like a, a basic enum because I don't think there's like a basic enum um, interface that you can type against, which is makes it a bit trickier. Well, I mean, even if you, I mean, if that was the case, so like if you're checking if it's not a, if you're, you can check to see if it's a backed enum if it is to get the string representation. But if it's not a backed enum, there's really nothing for you to do anyway. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't really do anything off that. I suppose you could well, do you arrow name, name instead of arrow yeah. value. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. You could do that. Um, so, any case, yeah. there we are. Then we also have Nick S. Dot contributed uh, the passing of backed enums to the route domain and name methods. So, um, if you're using route, double colon domain, you can pass in a backed enum to that and then also to the name method. So if you're giving your route a name and you want to use uh, you know, an enum where you can represent that as well, uh, that's a good spot to do that. You can use a backed enum in those as well without having to use the arrow value. So a couple of different places those are getting used at now and, now are, and are now available. Uh, that's most of everything. Of course, there's more fixes and updates that aren't included in the blog post, but you can find in the change log on GitHub between 11.21 and 11.22. All right, that takes us to 11.23. Michael, what do we got? Yeah, 11.23 was released this week at the time of the recording. And the big highlight, of course, for this feature was Taylor merging and then tagging the release for everything that was demonstrated at Laracon US 2024. So we will link to that for you in the show notes if you want to follow it up. But at a high level, it was the chaperone method, um, which we just talked about. There's the defer method. There's the cache flexible stuff that Tim McDonald work on, along with contextual container attributes and more. The documentation was also updated to support all of that. So there was the concurrency documentation, all of the container contextual attributes, which is the ability to, to kind of inject config values into your constructors and anywhere that the, the, the framework will handle dependency injection for you as long as um, the chaperone stuff deferred functionality. So I will have links to the keynote where you can go and get a, a more in-depth overview of all of that stuff. We also had <clears throat> a couple of other contributions from the community. First up, Cam Kemshul Bell added min and max ratio methods to the uh, or values operations, I suppose, to the dimensions validation rule. So you can specify um dimensions on your validation rules for um, uploading, I guess, images would be the main thing where you could specify that they should be a min and a max of whatever or specifying min ratio as a method name. So that doesn't make much sense, but <laughs> watch the video <laughs> or read the show notes. We'll have an explanation in there. Uh, but you can use these methods fluently. So you say rule, colon, colon, dimensions, and then you could say min ratio, 
and max ratio as method calls, or you could say ratio between as well, um, along with saying min underscore one, two, uh, which, sorry, you would have dimensions, you could say as the string values as well. So min underscore ratio, uh, ratio max underscore ratio, and then min ratio comma max ratio for between if you are, if you are um, preferring to use string-based rules in your validation. So thank you to Cam for that. And apologies for my butchering of the explanation. <laughs> um, further adding backed in um, support to various places of the framework, Dia Ferez contributed two pull requests that continue to add that support. This release of 11.23 includes updates to the gate and authorize, uh, sorry, the gate methods and the authorize middleware. So you can now say, instead of doing gate define, you can pass gate define and then store all of your abilities inside of an enum and pass that enum directly into the authorize or inspect or check or any or all of the gate methods without having to then tack on the arrow value there. And in the authorize middleware, uh, you can do the same thing. So you'd say middleware authorize colon colon using and then pass it a, um, an, a back to enum or the, the corresponding um, authorization ability. So thank you to DR for that one. Next up, Kennedy Tedesco contributed a skip middleware, which enables you to skip a job based on a condition. This middleware has three static constructor methods you can use, including when and unless. The job is skipped based on the results of the condition used. So you can say skip colon colon when, and then some condition that evaluates the true or false. Uh, you can do skip unless, and the same thing. You can even pass in a closure if you need to have more control over the logic for that. And this all goes into your jobs middleware function that you return an array from. And you can specify when conditionally the job should or shouldn't be done. So this is, you know, if you push a job onto a queue to be processed later, perhaps, and you would check in there, like, has some condition changed on the model that would preclude it from being uh, executed again? So, like, maybe you wanted to, in a future date, publish it, but you would check to see if it had already been published, for example, for a blog post. And you would just say, you know, if it has already been published, you would just skip running that job to publish it in the future. So thank you to Kennedy for that one. And last up in this release, Steve Bauman contributed a find or fail method to the eloquent collection class. This adds a way to find a model on an already populated collection, similar to how you would find or fail if you are running an eloquent query. So you can say, um, if you loaded all of your users into the data, uh, into a, a variable, so users equals user get, you can then say user find or fail one, um, or pass it a comma separated, or sorry, an array of values to find all of those values or, um, yeah, all of those values, I think. Um, and then you get a model not found exception if the model is not contained within that eloquent collection. So I did a very terrible job of explaining code as always, as, <laughs> as hard. I think we've said a few times in the past, you can watch on YouTube and we put in some snippets and some visually uh, explanatory things. If you are listening to this in your podcatcher, then we'll have links to everything in the show notes so you can make sense of what I have tried to explain verbally. But that is all for 11.23. I love it. I love the backing of support in all of the places now. It just, I mean, it makes it feel like that's the correct way to do it now. Um, and it really is. I mean, it really does allow you to basically get rid of all those little strings that you have sprinkled around. And so mm -hmm. love that. Oh, Skip cool. middleware, very clever. Uh, that's pretty cool too. So. Well, folks, we are now moving on to one of the bigger questions, uh, the big discussions that has happened in the last few weeks. So this was published on September 5th, and Taylor tweeted that morning this. I'm excited to announce that Laravel has raised a $57 million Series A in partnership with Excel. Um, so this was a bit of a bomb. I think that maybe a couple people had i mean it was it was sort of funny because a lot of people were like i knew it i saw it coming you know what i mean sort of deal but i felt like they actually handled the announcement really good because it or really well because it wasn't like they just dropped that and then walked away there was a whole set of follow up uh information about hey here's you know here is some questions that people are probably going to ask 
And here are our answers to those questions ahead of time. So it's like, if you don't provide a narrative, people will come up with their own, right? And so I feel like Laravel did a really good job of sort of providing that narrative and helping to answer any questions or quell any fears that people might've had. So really this post here goes through a lot of the questions that were answered inside of a special announcement video uh, interview with Aaron Francis. We're going to try and touch on the high points. I would encourage you, if you have any questions about what this means, what this is, go to the blog post, read it. It does a really good job of summarizing Taylor's follow-up tweets, as well as uh, all of the information display, or you know, all the all information in the video. And the video is like 35 minutes long. So you can read this blog post in about six minutes, uh, or you can watch the 35-minute video, uh, depending. So let me get through, hit some of the high points here. Here's what Taylor says. I believe that Laravel is the most productive way to build full stack web applications and Laravel cloud will be the platform for shipping those applications that this community quote deserves. And so he, he talked about this a couple times during his talk with Aaron, right? Um, why did they feel necessary to get an investment? And basically what it comes down to is it comes down to Taylor felt like they had gone as far as they could go uh, with the existing staff and the existing funding that they had. And so what he said basically was like, I can t- I could continue to coast or I could really swing for the fences, get some investment, build a team that could actually create the things that I've always wanted to create for the Laravel community. And he said, the people deserve this. The Laravel community deserves these tools and I want to give them to them. So that felt really good, right? The, the company didn't take the money because it was struggling. Um, the money is going into building out Laravel Cloud and building out the team. Um, so on that side though, uh, you know, on, on that sort of line of questioning, does that mean that they're done with open source contribu- contributions, right? Is, is Laravel as an ecosystem sort of going by the wayside and now they're going to be fun, you know, focusing on uh, projects that they can actually uh, make money off of? And the answer to that was a very clear no. That is, that is not the case at all. Um, Taylor is still leading Laravel as CEO. He's working closely with all the teams to ensure they're building the best products, but they're also committed to open source. They've hired additional engineering support for open source development. Um, Taylor himself is, is continuing to be the primary curator of all the features in the framework. Um, Inertia 2.0 uh, and the first party VS Code extensions only were able to be created because of the additional increased engineering capacity that they were able to ha- uh, hire with, uh, with that. The other thing that's cool as well is Excel is not just some venture you know, partner out there in the ether that just decided to throw some money at uh, their very first open source uh, you know, investment. This is, that's not the case. They've invested in other open source uh, developer-focused tooling spaces and uh, like, like Sentry, Vercel, Linear, um, they're a partner for all those folks. And so those, those you know, companies are doing really well. And uh, we uh, would hope to see Laravel follow that same path. So a couple of Q&A things that we didn't touch in, in that bit here. Um, what is Laravel Cloud, right? Laravel Cloud is really supposed to be the lowest barrier to entry uh, so that uh, you, know, you can get people that are brand new to development having the ability to deploy a PHP application within 60 seconds of signing up, right? Forge and Vapor are not going away. They are still going to be around. Um, there was some questions about, uh, you know, GDPR, SOC 2, some of these more enterprise-y uh, requirements that some folks have. This is on the docket. It's something they've looked into, uh, and they will eventually have them ready for Laravel Cloud, which is awesome. Um, uh, there is also uh, the question out there of, uh, can Laravel Cloud have spending limits applied? Yes, it, it can. It does. Is there going to be an API? Yes, there will. Um, and then also this hinting at another product being allow- announced at Laracon AU, uh, which we're interested, uh, to see and excited to hear about that one. Um, I think that's the majority of the things that I think is, are worth talking about here. Overall, here, here's the, the clincher, right? Should the community be nervous about the fact that Excel is now funding Laravel? And this is what Taylor said. He said Laravel is his, his life's work, right? He said it's hard to catch lightning in a bottle twice, right? This is his biggest contribution. He feels like this is going to be my dent in the universe, right? And his greatest professional accomplishment. He wants Laravel to succeed now more than he ever has. And he's committed to continuing to make it awesome. So 
I do not feel like this is something that we need to be nervous about. I think this is actually super exciting and uh, really looking forward to the next couple of years here in Laravel and uh, excited to see what they're going to be able to create. They've already, you know, they've already created some incredible tooling um, even in the last you know, six months. And so mm-hmm. excited to see what the future holds and i um, really excited for Tara, Taylor and the team. Yeah, just just two things to add to that. People had had commented, you know, why why wait? Because the the deal with Excel closed back in you know February of this year. So why wait until Laracon US or well, after Laracon US to announce it? And most of that boiled down to wanting to have something to show for that commitment. You know, to to show to the community, hey, we're we've got plans and we and we want to have something to show for it this is not just us taking money and then you know not not giving back or closing the framework or anything like the, the framework itself is still MIT um, licensed so it's still open and, and available to everyone so there was also a, a follow-up Laravel podcast which we'll link to in the show notes so Matt Stauffer sat down with Taylor and they went through a lot of the community q a as well that had come out since the announcement. And, and went through a lot of the stuff there as well. Um, and, you know, we'll probably keep an eye on that as as Laracon Australia, and we'll, um, you know, we'll have some questions for Taylor as well when he takes part in the panel discussion in November. So th- there'll be more to come, of course. You know, we're all, I'm, I'm optimistic um, in terms of what this means for the framework and the community and, and for, like, really PHP and its ecosystem at large in the coming years as well. So cool to see that that happen and and you know i'm optimistic for the future and where where this will take us as a community absolutely yep agreed agreed all right well that brings us to pest three pest three michael take it away yeah at laricon us uh nuno maduro who is the key core maintainer behind the pest project announced the release of pest version three which brings to the framework mutation testing and helps you level up your existing projects by finding untested code. It also helps you to create consistent code with popular architecture testing presets, team management, and a new configuration API. Um, So mutation testing is a new technique in PEST that introduces small changes to your code to see if the tests will catch them or to see if they fail, and it gives you more robust coverage of your code. So it would go through and like change little bits and bobs of the of the application and see you know where you have coverage of the the non happy paths, which is you know a trap that you can sometimes fall into. You test all of the happy paths, but you get all these edge cases that leak in. So mutation testing is a really good way of automatically, you know, exploring the edge cases in your code and seeing if you've got coverage for that, and it will help you to preemptively address bugs and things like that as well, which is really nice. Um, architecture testing is something that has been available in PEST since version 2, which allows you to kind of say, you know, only use HTTP namespaced objects inside the app HTTP folder. It allows you to add constraints into your code that like DD and dump and die and all those kinds of functions should not appear in your code base. So you don't accidentally push those debugging functions into production and cause things to break. Architecture presets allow you to specify, you know, specific um, opinions that have been made by the PEST team that say, like, these things should be strict or these things should be dynamic or um, this is like the Laravel preset and things like that. So there's the ability to kind of bundle up a whole bunch of these architecture rules and just get started with a whole bunch of different things very quickly and easily. There's a new configuration API that is more intuitive and easier to use. There is architecture testing improvements, which includes new expectations, a pest arch ignore line annotation, and more. Um, there's also constants in type coverage, static analysis improvements, and more. You can check out the official announcement post on the PEST website for in-depth coverage of the new features. You can install PEST version 3 into a new project, um, into a new Laravel project using Laravel new project name, and then dash dash test, or select it using the beautiful Laravel prompts. And you can also install it into a project by requiring pest php slash pest dash dash dev, and then running the pest init command. It does require, I am 99% sure, a minimum of Laravel um, 11, I'm pretty sure. Uh, But other than that, check it out. Lots of nice new features. The team management stuff is interesting. 
um, depending on on how you want to carve up your um, you know your tests and things like that. But it does allow you to say you know Jake is responsible for this functionality. You can assign work that way. You can say you know, and it's easy at a glance to say okay Jake worked on these things. If there's any um, you know issues that crop up in the future, so you know who to go and ask without going to dig through GitHub or through whatever ticketing system you're using, whether it's Jira or ClickUp or Linear or whatever. So. Lots of nice uh, in changes there as well. Yep, uh, awesome. Uh, we already updated our past two to past three uh, just recently. It was seamless, worked really great, and using some of these new features and absolutely loving them. So great job, Nuno, on the release. And I know that uh, there's even more changes in the pipeline. You know, little bug fixes and things like that coming out all the time. So great job to Nuno and anybody who is a past contributor. Thank you so much. Okay. And along with uh, that, we've got Laravel Heard version 111. Some changes that are coming in there. This was written up yesterday by Mr. Paul Redmond. Um, and so this new version of Heard is available right now. Um, it's a significant update that includes Laravel Forge integration, sharing Heard project configurations across the team, and a convenient profiler along with a few other features. So let's, let's talk about those in order. First one is Forge integration. So Herd now has direct integration with Laravel Forge, which enables you to deploy your sites directly from Herd. Uh, it opens an SSH connection on the server, or you can even uh, open your site on forge.laravel.com. So you just click through, pops you right open to your Forge server. Uh, you can head over to the documentation to figure out how that works, but that's a really nice, uh, really nice option now. So you just say, uh, I think it's integrations, and then you click the Forge button. You can connect Forge through there. Um, yeah. this sharing of configurations is really interesting. So you can now share project configurations with your team using a herd.yaml file in the root of your project. So, uh, you can figure like the project name, domain aliases, what PHP version it's using, if it's SSL certificates or not. Um, you can, I think in the pro version, you can also specify like the database, if there should be a new database set up, uh, Redis connections, things like that. And then all your team member has to do is they have to use herd init uh, on that project. And if your project uh, doesn't have the file, that init command will walk you through the setup process. So it's not something you have to even just hand write by yourself. You type herd init. If it's there, it will set up your project. If it's not, it will walk you through with Laravel prompts. Hey, what's the site name that you're going to use for this? Are you using a MySQL connection? Are you using a Redis connection? What's the, you know, should it be secured? Should it not? Um, so this is really nice. This is actually a problem we've tried to solve with something like a setup.shell file uh, that will run all of the, you know, that will help to try and do this. Hey, does the database exist? No, it doesn't. Okay, go create it. Uh, have we run the seeders yet? No, we haven't. Okay, go run them. Uh, have we installed NPM, you know, uh, stuff and done all the VEAT, whatever, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but uh, this is really nice. Herd init is all they have to do to get them up and running and all developers will then have the same setup. So really, really sm uh uh, nice, smart uh, feature here added by the team. Uh, excited to, to try that one out. In addition, there's a new profiler for identifying performance issues in your code. Now, I know if you're like me, Laravel debug bar is the thing that you typically reach for, um, which is excellent, but it is an additional composer dependency, a dev only, which is fair, uh, but this makes it so you don't even have to do that, right? So this profiler... Uh, it can just be installed by running uh, herd profile, and that's it. And then all it does is it has a a um, a herd profiler that loads at you know inside your browser, uh, and it uses this SPX, I think is what it is, mm -hmm. behind the scenes. I looked it up just a couple minutes ago. Um, I use this SPS this SPX debugger, which is a really insanely detailed um, debug. That you can, it reminds me of like Chrome's where you can like narrow yeah, in just time, on a particular timeline. Time. Yeah, just a particular part of the timeline. And then you can see exactly what was happening. Um, you know, the memory used, you could see uh, how long something took to execute, um, et cetera, et cetera. Really, really, really detailed. So uh, you can get started with that by just typing herd profile. So that's really nice. Uh, there's also dump UI improvements. So herd's dump debugging feature has a new custom PHP extension that makes, makes using DD and dump automatic. So you can also configure herd to dump queries, HTTP requests, views, jobs, logs, etc. 
Um, really, really nice. And you can actually, this is cool. You can say only dump out for me queries that take longer than X amount of time. So you can say don't dump all the queries. Just see if there's any that take longer than two seconds to go to run. And if it takes longer than two seconds, then make it show up in my dump window here, which is pretty cool. Um, and so this would have been something that you probably would have done with like telescope before, right? So it's like yeah. all these interesting tools, uh, that previously were their own disparate sort of packages. If you're using herd, you kind of get all these things for free without having to install anything. And it works across all your different projects that you're hosting with herd. So really, really nice stuff. Um, that is it for the announcement here. I just installed the new version today. Uh, I was trying to get the profiler set up and uh, interested. That's, that's probably the thing that's the most interesting to me. So I'm going to be working on that first. And uh, we'll loop back on this. I'll let you know how awesome it is and how much I love it. There we go. Cool. Heard 11, nice. 1.11. 1.11. I did also notice that uh, Heard for Windows is now available. Now, I was under the impression that Heard for Windows was open like free the same as heard for for mac os was it may have actually been the pro only version that was released initially and now okay window heard for windows is available for for everyone so the got it non-pro version not having service management and some of the i their extra bits and pieces on there but should be available to more people there so check that out if you are on windows it is far and away the easiest way to get set up and running um for php development Laravel development on uh, on any platform now, really. Well, except for, I suppose, Linux at this stage. Or is it on Linux as well? I could be wrong. It's not on Linux and it's not planned. It's not right. planned to be released uh, okay. for Linux. Okay, good. All right, so Mac and Windows is definitely the easiest way to get going. Mm-hmm. Win- mm-hmm. Uh, Linux, you know what you're doing. You're on your own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got it. You All got right. Uh, next up in the creator series that uh, Eric Barnes is running over on our YouTube channel, Ben Holman talks about building connections and friendships through pair programming with strangers. Collaboration can be a powerful catalyst for growth. And Ben Holman, a passionate advocate of pair programming, has taken this idea to the next level with his new project, the Pyramid Scheme. The initiative is designed to connect programmers with strangers, creating opportunities to work together on coding projects in a collaborative and meaningful way. So I won't go into too much more detail about that, but if you would like to check that out, it is, uh, it is available in audio and video form on the Laravel News uh, YouTube channel. We'll have a link to that for you in the show notes. Very nice. Uh, we've also got one more item here in the news, which is called Tempest PHP Extension for, v- for VS Code. I'm going to spell Tempest here. It's T-E-M-P-H-P-E-S-T. So, you could be tempted to think this is temp <sighs> past PHP <laughs> extension, the or think it has something, song. yeah, or it has something to do with past. It does not. It's Tempest PHP extension for VS Code. What is it? It's an extension for Visual Studio Code to improve writing PHP in VS Code. So this is created by Liam Hammett. Um, it features a lot of uh, PHP niceties that enhance the experience while you're writing PHP. Um, So there's a listing of the extension features here. I'm going to go through them real quick. Stubs for file creation, auto renaming code actions, auto switching to PHP language, interpolation from single quotes to double quotes, surrounding with snippets, explorer file nesting. There's a REPL as you write, date formatting lens, auto completion, blade, here doc, and now doc, now doc syntax highlighting, and more. And so this uh, goes through all the different items. Uh, I think Paul Redman wrote this one up uh, regarding stubs, code actions, uh, interpolating of values, all those things. Uh, And so if you're interested in using that, uh, you can see that in the show notes, you can search for Tem PHP Est Tempest Visual Studio Code on uh, the Marketplace page. Uh, in the VS Code extensions menu, and you can install it that way as well. Um, just on this note here, I wanted to also, and again, you know, I'm not trying to rain anybody's parade here. This is this is awesome. Um, but if you happen to be using Laravel, which a lot of you are, um, remember that the VS Code extension uh, is supposed to be 
uh, launched hopefully in early November. So just FYI, FYI something to keep on your radar. Um, I'm sure both are unique and great in their own ways. Um, but because I didn't mention that earlier, I did want to just mention that, that that was the hopeful release date for the Laravel VS Code extension is early November. Okay. Um, have you heard anything about these wide events before? Wide, wide events? events? Yeah, wide mm-hmm. events in the context of application logs and observability is just a collection of properties that may be useful later. The more information you have, the better. Think about all the context around a web request. The wider your events, the better prepared you'll be for unknown mm-hmm. and unknowns. Indeed. Those sneaky bugs that you cannot anticipate. Observability isn't rocket scientists, but the industry likes to pretend that it is. And HoneyBadger.io is challenging that assumption with HoneyBadger Insights. HoneyBadger's approach to observability is simple. First, log everything with wide structured events, then query and graph your events with BadgerQL, the powerful query language at the heart of HoneyBadger Insights that allows you to ask questions about your systems and build quick charts and dashboards. Insights is available on HoneyBadger's free tier as part of their comprehensive monitoring suite, which includes error tracking, uptime monitoring, status pages, and more. You can install HoneyBadger today and be ready to navigate the unknown unknowns of your next incident. Visit HoneyBadger.io to learn more. That is HoneyBadger.io. Very cool. This Badger QL, that query language is something that they've created themselves, right? And so it's really, really fast and allows you to get insights into all these events really easily. You should definitely go check that out. Uh, even if you just take it for a little demo drive, I think it could be really helpful for you. So thanks for visiting our sponsor and thanks Honey Badger for sponsoring the show. Okay, we are back at it. We've got a couple packages left, one tutorial. Let's go, a qu- eloquent filtering package. So this is a package that enhances the process of building dynamic query filters in Eloquent. I feel like Spassi might have one of these as well. Um, But whether you're managing large data sets or building complex search functionality, Eloquent filtering helps you to streamline that experience. So what is this? What is this package uh, doing? It's allowing developers to filter models dynamically based on incoming request data. So we're not talking about having a bunch of scopes that you're creating behind the scenes, right? What we're saying is we want you to be able to let your users create uh, filters basically on your models based on the data that they're sending in. So rather than manually chaining multiple query conditions, that pack- the package abstracts that whole process so it enables uh, a more readable and maintainable code base. So there's a basic example here, uh, which is your your product model in this case implements this is filterable trait and then uses a uh i'm sorry implements an is filterable contract what's that called interface Interface. thank you contract interface uh and then it uses the filterable trait and so it has a list of allowed filters then and so you can set up hey here are the different types i have a name filter that i want them to be able to do to use and the filter type that i'm going to have there is going to be an equal so like they can send a name and whatever name they send in it needs to be equal to that name that's what the filter is going to do and then so what you say is product filter and then you pass in those values and then you just say get and it, that's it. That's it's all you have to do. So you set them up ahead of time, the allowed filters, and then you pass them to that filter and it will just handle managing that for you. Um, there's a field and relationship filter example. So you can filter not only on the, the properties of a particular model, but also across relationships as well. Um, and I'm not going to attempt to read all of the code on here. Uh, suffice it to say, if this is a problem you've had to solve before, you know that this can get crazy really quickly. And so this package does a very good job at abstracting that, giving you a really nice API to define what these filters should be, and then allows you to apply request values to those filters easily so that you don't have to pull your hair out trying to figure this out by yourself. So really good official docs. Uh, this is version two of the package. So it's not been you know just around for a little bit of time. It's been around for quite a while. And uh, looks like a great package if you happen to need that problem solved. Thanks, Eric, for writing that one up. Nice. Uno PIM is a product information management system built with Laravel. It is an open source tool that you can use to organize, manage, and enrich product information in one central place. Features of the open source package include the ability to manage all of your product data in one place, 
enhance your product information with detailed attributes, organize products into categories for easier navigation with customizable category fields, control user access and permissions, seamlessly integrate with other systems via RESTful APIs, the ability to localize everything using um, multiple languages and locales, import and export functionality, allowing you to import and export using CSV and Excel formats with a quick export feature for streamlining data handling, Magic AI for product content generation, which allows you to automatically generate engaging product content using advanced large language module technologies and multi-channel support, enabling you to manage and distribute your product data across multiple sales channels from a single platform. So if you are in a place where you need to manage a product catalog and you need to be able to distribute that to some kind of ERP, manage your suppliers, handle media files and marketing, whether you want to push it to an e-commerce store, or a retail point of sale system or marketplaces or a mobile app, perhaps you can check out UnoPM. Maybe not even if it's you, dear listener, that is doing this, but if you have a client that needs this kind of functionality, this may be an option to check out. We have links to that for you in the show notes. Hmm. That is interesting. I'm going to have to look at that one a little bit more. Um, mm. I'm going to have to look at that one a bit more. But Paul wrote it up, so I know it must be really nice and useful. Okay, speaking of nice and useful, um, Eric also had Ben Bergerstrom. Bergerstrom? Is that it? Maybe? Bjorstrom. Close? Bjorstrom? Ah, should have known. Ben Bjorstrom on uh, the Laravel Creator Series to talk about his new um, package called Preset. 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 I bet it's Preset. It's like present, but it's not present, it's present. And so what this is, this is markdown blogging for Laravel. So the really nice thing about this is that this is built to work with your existing Laravel application, right? Um, what it does is it allows you to take markdown files and then it will transform them into SEO friendly blogs, articles, or documentation. So there's a whole YouTube video on this. Uh, ben uh, is kind of breaking it down and how he created it, why he created it, what the motivation was. Um, but that key difference here is that Preset is designed to run within your Laravel app. So you get things like um, it's not a separate application to deploy. It just deploys with your existing application content and Laravel. Uh, your content and your Laravel applications coexist in a single code base, one deployment process. It's familiar because you already know how to use Laravel and Blade, and so you don't need to learn a new framework. Um, and it's seamlessly integrated with the rest of your Laravel superpowers, right? So if you need something like a mailing list sign up in your blog, no problem. Just to use an existing Laravel uh, method to do so, set up a Laravel route, and Bob's your uncle. There you go. So the installation steps are really simple. You require it, you install it, and then you say present index, present index. Now the index, what I noticed in the documentation is that it does use SQLite behind the scenes hmm. for this index by default. There may be a different way to do that, but I think that's the intent is that you're going to use SQLite for this. The installation grind has a full breakdown of what these commands do and why they're needed. Uh, but that was one thing I noticed. Here are some of the features. Markdown powered, blade components, optimized images, so it automatically converts uh, images to WebP, which is by far the best compression algorithm, um, and also generated source sets. And so what that's you know talking about there is that it will only serve the size that's required for the screen size that you have. It's not gonna try and serve an 800 pixel wide image to a 200 pixel wide user on a phone. Uh, it's gonna automatically generate those source sets for you. It has typed front matter, which is really nice. These are cast to DTOs to ensure data consistency across your content. This is great uh, for things like SEO tags, right? Auto-generating meta, ta meta tags from that front matter data so that you can boost your search engine discoverability. And then it also has that uh, open graph image generations. Uh, so it will uh, generate those open graph images for you for your social media sharing. Uh, you should definitely check it out on Preset today. It's https colon slash slash Preset, P-R-E-Z-E-T, Dot com if you're looking for a markdown friendly blogging app pretty cool nice just the one tutorial this week which is fairly topical given the upcoming release of laravel cloud this is a tutorial from christoph Dombey. prepare your laravel app 
for the cloud. It talks about local development environments running Laravel without a database and with a database um, preparing for production, deploying to the cloud. In this instance, we are talking about Savala, which is a um, containerized application hosting platform. Um, and and how you get this. So this is all Docker based, but it talks you through having one container that goes from, you know, from your development environment to you know CI to staging to production all all the way through the whole cycle. So uh, if that's something that is of interest to you, check it out. We'll have a link to that for you in the show notes. Thank you to Christoph. Excellent, folks. That takes us to the end. Unless you have anything else to say, Michael, I'm going to be closing this one out. We're 50 minutes, so this one's running a little bit longer than we're typically used to. Any any final thoughts before I go through the rapid fire closeout? Nothing to add. Honey Badger, thanks so much for sponsoring the show. Episode 223. You can find show notes for this episode at podcast.laravel-news.com slash 223. If you liked us, rate us up on your podcatcher of choice. Five stars would be amazing. And if you have any questions, hit us up on Twitter at Michael Dorinda, at Jacob Bennett, or at Laravel News. Until next time, folks, two weeks. We'll see you later. Boom. Peace. Bye.